everyone, my name is Havza Keka and I am the Officer of Homeless Solutions with the City of Riverside. Very excited today to be joined by wonderful panelists in this amazing project. The project is called the Riverside Community Shelter Village and it's essentially another name for our pallet shelter community that is housing unsheltered homeless individuals. I have the blessing to be able to work in several different communities. I uh, started working in homelessness in Los Angeles and so obviously you know one of the biggest communities in the entire nation, the largest in California. And um, LASA is Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, which is a joint powers authority that manages the continuum of care funding, um, funds over 300 nonprofits, uh, and has the largest uh, continuum of care funding from HUD to address programs and services. I was the coordinated entry um, coordinator there. So I worked with all the different jurisdictions in LA city and LA county to integrate permanent supportive housing um, placements for unsheltered individuals, um, whether they be on the street or sheltered into um, in a bridge housing situation. Um, from there, I went to Santa Ana as Santa Ana's first homeless services manager overseeing primarily large projects such as a 200 bed shelter um, that at the time was a congregate shelter um, to address a huge um, litigative environment with uh, federal judge Carter who was aiming to ensure that there is regional equity in addressing homelessness in Orange County. And I recently joined um, City of Riverside about a year ago. I can't believe it's almost going to be a year. And we uh, have congratulations. Been... <laughs> Thank you. Matt Bates, uh, Executive Vice President of CityNet. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that's contracted as the operator on site for the Riverside Community Shelter Village. Um, as a nonprofit organization, we provide homeless services in Riverside County. Orange County, LA County, and Santa Barbara County. So we're excited to be on this project and have been happy to be um, to be with it since day one. The last six months has been, everything's different because of COVID. Um, so um, we have, uh, you know, for example, in Riverside, uh, we operated an emergency quarantine facility for the city of Riverside. Um, but uh, as of tonight, we have, um, we operate a, a temporary emergency shelter in Santa Ana, um, we offer an emergency quarantine facility that serves the cities of Fullerton and La Habra. And then we operate the, um, the Riverside Community Shelter Village and then also some bridge housing for the city of Riverside. Um, so a total of about uh, 200 beds is what we operate on a nightly basis. So, uh, hey everyone, my name is Brandon Bills. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications for Pallet Shelter. Uh, obviously, Pallet was heavily involved in this project and we were Super pleased to be working with great partners like the City of Riverside and CityNet. Uh, Pallet builds rapid, personal, and dignified shelter communities for people experiencing homelessness across America. Pallet's been around for about four years. Uh, I'd say the first three of those years we were figuring out the shelter. We were doing a lot of prototyping. We had a few early adopters and some early communities set up. Our longest standing community is about three years old now. Uh, that was with the city of Tacoma, Washington. Um, they were one of our, our very first adopters of this community model with personal shelter. Since then, we've, we've grown, especially in the past year. Um, we currently operate, we're approaching two dozen shelter communities across America, mostly on the West Coast. As you alluded to, California is probably our, our, our densest state for the number of shelter communities that we have. Uh, but we currently have shelter communities in Hawaii, California, uh, Washington, we're opening up a new one in Oregon City and Texas. We'll be building new shelter communities in Arkansas in the next uh, month or so, which is our furthest east. Um, and, but yeah, we've, we've been around. COVID really accelerated our growth, though, to be honest. We are, we're a personal shelter solution. And with COVID, obviously, social distancing and physical distancing is key. So we have this massive influx of interest as soon as COVID hit. We have multiple cities calling us. We've got probably another two dozen communities in development right now that we expect to build in the next six months. Uh, I'm excited to say though that Riverside was pre-COVID, so they appreciated us before before the virus hit. Uh, but yeah, we're 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 established and growing with close to two dozen shelter communities existing right now. Interesting. And like, what's the split between like what's the popula what's the various populations that there that these communities are set up as? Are they mostly for natural disaster um, 
or like hospital use or is it uh, for people experiencing homelessness or who, who are you mostly serving with those, sh those shelter villages? Yeah, so we almost exclusively serve homelessness right now. We're in discussion with some disaster response and recovery agencies that have seen value in the shelter that we make, uh, especially for people that are displaced post disaster. So you can imagine in a wildfire setting where residents of a state lose everything, they need someplace temporary and they don't feel safe going to a congregate shelter. Uh, we're in discussions for that, but almost exclusively right now, the majority of our communities are serving people experiencing homelessness and acting as a stepping stone off the streets and into something more permanent. We have done so much in this one year. So uh, my first city council meeting actually was for the pallet shelters. Um, so circle then right back one year full later. Circle, yeah. Yeah, so came in first city council meeting was really us pushing to increase our shelter uh, beds. We, did, we didn't have a lot of shelter beds in the city. And of course we want to aim towards permanent housing, permanent supportive housing for individuals experiencing homelessness as the end solution. But we do understand that that takes some time, right? And so in the interim, we wanna be able to create shelter to have operators such like CityNet um, to be able to engage and get people ready for permanency and self-sufficiency. So with that being said, um, our really the etiology of the pallet shelter came from our mayor. Um, I just want to acknowledge our mayor, Rusty Bailey, who's been such a proponent of addressing homelessness. One of the reasons why I felt that there was so much um, support in this um, city and what the mayor did, which was in the local news, is he actually bought a pallet shelter himself, placed it in our Hewlin campus of services where we have a plethora of, of services in the parking lot there and slept in it. So here's the first resident. Many. Yeah, he was the first resident for many, many days, months, actually, to really um, let uh, people know that, you know, we need to increase shelter. Um, and right outside of that area was, it was, now I could confidently say, um, our largest encampment within the city it was probably about 100, um, uh, you know, tents and encampments. And so the mayor was really a proponent in saying, you know what, let's get these little mini pallet shelters. We could put them on the parking lot and we have immediate shelter. Um, from there, what we did is, um, you know, I took it to council uh, with our city manager's uh, blessing, uh, did a bunch of uh, research research. We reviewed sort of the San Diego's um, sprung shelter. We reviewed uh, Oakland's cabin shelter. We reviewed all these different um, sort of uh, options. And one of the options that we presented to council um, and their first council meeting actually, because we had new elections. So we had, we were lucky to have such a uh, support of new council members for homeless uh, services was the pallet shelter. So we talked about how it would be sturdy, how it would be a great immediate response system and how it would be different different in the sense that it's something that individuals uh, who are experiencing homelessness want sort of their own space and their own privacy. Um, I see both the operator and, um, you know, pilot structures, Brandon nodding. We understand that individuals experiencing homelessness want that autonomy to be able to um, thrive in, in, in becoming self-sufficient. And so council ratified it. Among that, we also took an emergency ordinance to pretty much waiver any procurement processes and um, to really expedite um, shelter structure for the city through uh, public uh, or city property. And so with that being said, um, we were able to work very quickly. Uh, we quickly said that we wanted 30 pallet shelters and that we would have two double occupancy in them. Um, so it'd be two uh, beds. And we quickly realized that, you know, the operator that we were working with, CityNet for outreach would be a great asset because they've already uh, engaged in outreach and and, um, engagement services. So the clients already had a rapport with them. So council approved it in December of 2017. In January, our um, general services, uh, along with all hands on deck, pallet shelter, um, guys, you guys came out, started to deliver it and put it together. February, um, we, you know, we completed our scope with our operator and the budget, and we included many things. Matt is probably going to talk about, you know, meals and such nature and, um, we went ahead and we got it up and going within 12 weeks. So council ratified it in December and March, uh, right, actually, I think it was March 13th. It was so like right the day, the day of. Right before Governor Newsom announced it. And so, which was really important <clears throat> because we were going to do double occupancy, but what we ended up doing was one occupancy in order to adhere to the um, COVID regs. How big is the site? 
So it's a parking lot. I don't remember the square foot, but we have approximately 30 uh, little mini pallet shelters. We have bathrooms that are two, we have four. So part of that, we have uh, four ADA structures, uh, two ADA bathrooms, and um, also uh, some regular bathrooms. We were able to include hygiene stations that we got through the state for COVID funding. And what's really exciting is that, you know, we did the, the sort of press release and Governor Newsom actually visited our access center, which is across the street in, in January. And when he visited that access center, um, we actually had a client by the name of Peggy who was um, provided a key to the mayor's pallet shelter saying, hey, Peggy, you know, just wait a few months, you're going to get your own. And so she quickly became a star. She got her key. And literally within one month of moving into the pallet shelter and the work of CityNet, um, she was able to secure a tenant-based rental assistance. So she got her own apartment and that's listed in our social media with her pictures. So, um, awesome. Yeah, a it's lot a of perfect case study of someone transitioning from literally yeah. interim transitional housing housing to permanent housing with, I mean, and not Peggy. everyone gets a key from the, from the governor, but. <laughs> well, one of the things that the city also did was when we ratified or we took this to council for the shelter, we didn't just say shelter and that's it. What we did was we worked with our housing authority to say that, you know, council please also approve tenant-based rental assistance. So there's going to be a continuity of care. So it goes from outreach to the pallet shelter and then to, um, you know, housing, uh, permanent housing. So that's sort of how it worked out. So I mean, um, so the uh, the site was already. So I guess talk a little bit more about the site. So the mayor was sleeping in this shelter on the site that would become the Riverside Community yeah. Village. Because of our emergency ordinance, we were actually able to go ahead and utilize uh, very quickly a city-owned site uh, without any, um, you know, barriers. If we were to go through a private or a broker, then, you know, you'd have to yeah. go through escrow and all of that. So that site is just a huge parking lot, and it's right outside of our access center and our um, Path of Life shelter, which is another shelter that we work in conjunction with. And then next door to that is a um, uh, call the place, which is County uh, Behavioral Health Services as well. And we're expanding our entire cul-de-sac, this Hewland campus. We're going to have UCR medical clinic for um, marginalized folks. And we're also going to have helping hearts, which is mental health beds. And we're also going to have bridge housing, which is going to be additional beds. Yeah. It's really kind of a unique, uh, con I mean, it's a, it's a neat, unique complex because it's sort of centralizing a bunch of different organizations that are sol solving or working on the same problem all in one space. You sort of have the whole, uh, life cycle of services, I guess, for various populations from one kind of two block area, right? Yeah, and it was so cool to see the pallet, Brandon and his team, you know, they just come out, they put it together so quickly. I think they put it together in about two weeks or maybe one week, if I'm unsure. Yeah, I, I think it was just a week. I do want to point out after hearing Hafsa, first of all, thank you Hafsa for the, the great overview of how this all came together. And since we're talking about how this all comes together behind the scenes, it's not as simple as just a case study or a one pager. I do want to point out this theme that ran under everything Hafsa said and that the city of Riverside had declared a state of emergency around homelessness and then they acted accordingly. So in so many cities across America, they say they have an issue and people that are in elected positions are trying their hardest to make a change for the positive impact of their citizens who are experiencing homelessness. What I was so impressed with from Hafsa, the mayor of Riverside, Rusty Bailey, and the rest of the team there is that they put their money where their mouth is and they got moving. They helped uh, their residents get off the street and into something that's more dignified. So I, I really want to appreciate the urgency and the speed at which Hafsa and the rest of the Riverside team acted. They, again, they declared a state of emergency, then they acted on it. Uh, so just to kind of uh, take, a, take a deeper dive on that emergency shelter um, motion that was made emergency, to ask the counter uh, uh, question, you know, homelessness isn't new for most California cities in the past 10 or 20 or 30 years. So what made 2019, the de December, the tipping point, the trigger, what was the trigger that made you guys act versus the previous years? 
Charlie, that's an excellent question. Excellent question. So, um, you know, I have my stats up here. You know, in 2019, the, the county of Riverside had 2,000 unsheltered uh, individuals, over 2,000, um, which is a 21% increase in, from 2018. And in 2019, um, we had 439 unsheltered. And so January um, was a point in time count. We didn't have to wait for the point in time count to know that, you know, we saw the visible increase in homelessness. And, um, you know, so we started, council approved it, and then came out the stats from point in time count, and our unsheltered for 2020 um, is 587 now. So, and of course, these are self-reported, so we imagine that there's more folks. And so we were correct. You know, we had an increase of individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, and the reality of it is that with homelessness, if you even see one person, even if it's one, it's not going to get better unless we house the individual. Um, and, you know, the cost of housing is so much in, in California. Um, so our housing with our authority is also working on several different projects in affordable housing. So um, it's been a priority for the city um, the manager's office. It's been a priority where we have dedicated funds and we are part of the big 30 city as well. So the big 13 city are uh, big 13 cities, over 500,000 um, people that have a very dense population that also have a community of uh, poverty and um, overwhelming, overburdened um, homeless population. So you've got Santa Ana, you've got Anaheim, you've got Oakland, San Francisco, San Diego, LA, of course, um, and Riverside and Stockton were one of the few ones that added in the end. And what makes us a big 13 is our mayors coming together, all of those cities' mayors coming together, going to Sacramento, talking to Governor Newsom's office, telling him that, you know, we need more support and more services and more funds to address local um, homeless issues. And we were able to get one time block grants like HEAP, which is the Homeless Emergency Aid Program, and HAP, which is the Homeless Housing Assistance Prevention Program, which is um, hmm. part of the funding that was dedicated to the. It was really the cities asking the state to sort of come up with a one time grant to fund these types of developments? Yeah, trailer bills. Uh, I remember when I was in Santa Ana, I was working on you know, reviewing some trailer bills over here. Our uh, mayor's office is very involved. Um, you know, Mayor Mayor Rusty Belly is, is advocating as much as possible. So yeah, so the HAP funding is what we dedicated for this project. And like the, the, uh, the from, from a regional context standpoint, so, so, you, so you're an employee of City of Riverside, but Riverside has a bunch of, uh, you know, neighboring communities and how does like the continuum of care, what's the jurisdiction of the continuum of care? Because isn't that sort of like a regional problem? How did the city, um, how is the city chosen to step up versus like the region or, or how, how is that coordinated with like the neighboring communities? Yeah. Charlie, you're asking some great questions. So um, <laughs> anybody who received a housing and homeless assistance program from the state, they received it in three different buckets. The first bucket was big 13 cities. And I'm sure Matt knows this really well, too, because he's working with a lot of the big 13 cities out in Orange County. Um, also, you have the Continuum of Care, which is a governing body that receives the HUD, Housing Urban Development Funds, to spew out programs and services. And then the third is the county itself. And so the state is really saying, you know what, county? COC, big 13 cities, you guys work together, work together on a regional collaborative. So, you know, what's really exciting is when a city gets its own pocket of funding, we could sort of move a little quicker, right? right. Um, so we are still working on a collaborative basis with the county and the COC on other projects. But with this one, we knew that we could fairly move pretty quickly quickly. Hmm. And in terms of why big 13 cities, typically they're the county seat. Typically there were a lot of the services are downtown, right? And so we understand that, you know, these are the heavy hit areas. And as such, we are um, sort of tasked to create programs and services. So the city of Riverside in context of the regional coordination has really emerged as a leader and has really emerged as sort of the best practice model, especially Brandon, you know, I'm so happy we were able to take part of uh, the pallets quicker because it's perfect as a non-congregate shelter during COVID crisis. Is the emergent, like the one-time grant that you got from the state, it's to be spent on uh, developing more bed space capacity or what's the, what's the overall mission or purpose of it? Is it just to like fund a, a sort of a, a range of different interim shelter or emergency shelter uh, solutions yeah. or is it just for adding bed space? 
Yeah, no, you're taking me back to the time that we completed the application. So there's different eligibility buckets, right? So you could have an eligibility bucket for outreach. You can do shelter beds. You can um, have it for capital, for affordable housing. You could do prevention. You could do rapid rehousing funds, which are quick uh, subsidy funds to get folks into housing. You could use it for um, sort of youth. Youth set aside dollars are really important. So working with transitional age youth, um, you could have it for also um, HMIS, which is a homeless management information systems and sort of a systematic strategic plan. So we decided that all the buckets we got, this is one of the buckets that we wanted to make sure that we funded CityNet as an operator for. You know, that that transition from what was previously the big 11 to the big 13 was was huge that Riverside and and Stockton got included in that um, that that opened up um, significant av avenues of funding for the city that made projects like this and others happen. Um, so I think there's a couple of components into, you know, why did the project like this, you know, materialize and, and really so quickly and so effectively. I think one certainly is the funding. Um, but the other thing that I would say from our perspective as an operator, and I'm sure Brandon could probably speak to this too, is that we just found the city of Riverside to be really easy to work with um, because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of skill resident within the city. I mean, part of that is because it's a large city um, that's been dealing with homelessness for a long time. So this wasn't their first time that they were, they weren't having to learn about homelessness on the fly. Um, but also, you know, all of the, you know, the million little details that, that need to come together on a project like this. Like, how are you gonna hook up water and power and sewage and uh, uh, the, the slope and drainage and all of, those, all of those details. You know, I remember uh, there was one meeting where, you know, we made the decision from an operating standpoint that what we wanted to do with the restrooms was we wanted to hook them up to existing plumbing, existing sewage and plumbing rather than, um, have them go into temporary tanks that would need to be pumped system, by yeah. trucks on a regular basis. Yes, septic system that would need to be pumped out by trucks on a regular basis. So that made much better sense operationally, but looking at the site that necessitated a, an entire switching, you know, flipping of the entire site plan um, because the, all the hookups were up at the top of the, uh, top of the slope near the street, near Massachusetts Avenue. Hmm. Um, and we had originally planned to put them down at the bottom of the slope farthest away from Massachusetts Avenue. So we, we had to flip everything around. Um, and those are the kind of things that like those kind of decisions, how they get made. And then once they're made, all the all of the impacts that just could take months, you know, in many cases to resolve. But we were standing around a table and and the city had the right people in the room with the authority and the experience to do it and could make decisions in real time and make the right decisions and effective decisions so that um, so that then we could move on to the next thing. Who, who so there were was, the people that were, there was that a were in the room that were, that, um, were good to have on, on day one? Like, I'm assuming the fire department and building and safety and, um, like, who, who were those, who were those, like, key people in the room to provide the feedback to quickly make the decision? Yeah, so Hasha probably would speak to that. I mean, I would, I would add into that. I know uh, certainly the, um, uh, like, their, their, their police department and their, uh, code enforcement. So, and and us as the outreach operators, we were invited into those meetings so that we could speak to, from a from a a client or a prospective client, for, you know, standpoint on you know what the needs of the clients might be, what uh, what might be appealing or not appealing to them, how they are were likely or not likely to use it, how to handle things like um, uh, like storage and food and pets and all those. You know, we were brought in um, and invited to the table. Um, along with the city in a series of meetings, um, and then and then uh, those other departments that you mentioned, and maybe there's others, Hasa, that you that you recall too in those early days. Yeah, yeah. So you know, our general services is really the sort of the the. Um, the meat and potatoes, right? They make it happen. They're the ones who's got all the vendors, the connections, and also our general services worked with Brandon and their team kind of, you know, with the invoicing. Okay, this is when you need to have it delivered. This is when, you know, um, where you could put it. This is where the pipes are. This is where the electricity. So um, general services was really the meat and potatoes, but we believe in all hands on deck. And we believe that when everyone is involved and they're able to contribute with their expertise, it's going to be efficient and it's going to be successful. So we definitely wanted Matt and his team and they've done such a great job driving all the way from Orange County and just being part of every single 
virtual conversation. At that time, there was no COVID. So we all just got in a room. We took the site plan. We had an architect um, that our general services got us. And she did an amazing job, just really, really well versed in how to do lay of the land things. And then we also had, like you mentioned, our fire. We had our PD. We had our um, public works at some point. We had our public utilities at another point. And of course, the Office of Homeless Solutions and even our housing authority, because we knew that people were going to get, you know, transferred into housing afterwards. So it's all hands on deck, including Brandon and his amazing team and sitting and their amazing team. Yeah, one, one thing I'll add to that, too, is that, um, again, to echo what Matt had said, Riverside did an exemplary job. So we work with a variety of different types of cities. Every city has a different team and they, they don't all function. They don't all run as smoothly as Hopsa's team does. Um, but we're happy to advise because we work in other cities, we can say, this is how Riverside handled this challenge that you're running into, or this is how Sonoma County handled this challenge. In the case of Riverside, I think it starts with great leadership on the part of the team where they, like Hofsta said, it was all hands on deck and they had everybody running where we actually had people calling us saying, okay, we're thinking about this. Can you advise on this? So they were way more proactive. We're happy to play either role, whether you want more input from us or if you want us to kind of stand back and wait until we're invited to the table, we're happy to do either. But it was such a pleasure to work with Riverside because their team was running so smoothly and, and firing at all cylinders. Was, you, Brandon, was I, guess, I have a the funny story. Quarterback? She was the quarterback <laughs> of the team. That like. Yeah. <laughs> the quarterback in high heels. <laughs> yeah, you were calling all the shots and all the plays and, and telling Well, I'll tell go. you this. The real the real uh, quarterback is our deputy city manager, Moises Lopez, and he is a wonderful leadership. And, you know, it, I always say that a city that does have a deputy city manager is really crucial because that's that person is really the integrative force um, that sees what's happening from the administrative level back up to the city managers and really is able to funnel the funding and make things happen um you know so uh when it was last minute stuff when it was stuff that needed to go into city council you know just having less as brandon mentioned um a very strong executive leadership is very important and i have to give you a quick funny story with brandon and his team so i went to the national alliance to end homelessness i think city net your team was uh, out there as well in oakland in february um right before the pandemic and you know with the national alliance to end homelessness you have a booth of a whole bunch of uh, programs and services from HMIS to different nonprofit providers to even furniture uh, folks who are who are who specialize in in shelter furniture and you saw this big little pallet and I'm like hey so I walk over there and you know it's Brandon's colleague and they're like hey look what's on my phone and it's just from Riverside you know I was in Oakland and uh, he was in Oakland but we got a picture from home back home here saying this is how much they've uh, you know worked so they were already working and they already started to develop some pallets so it was really cool to be a city at that conference that actually had hmm. this um sort of you know uh, palette that they were showing off saying hey look here we are and when i say show it off I, I really i really think that was important it's important to be able to show what it looks like you walk in it's spacious you know you it's can the power actually... of a showcase yes mm -hmm. yes yeah totally and I, we agree that we it actually Pre-COVID, we were doing these road shows where we would take one shelter onto the road. We would go to places like the National Alliance to End Homelessness Conference in Oakland that House is mentioning. Since the pandemic, obviously we're not traveling as much as we used to. So we've shifted to do virtual tours. Uh, and I know we've got one coming up with the- uh, Yeah, I was gonna say, you're, you're putting yeah. in a plug for your upcoming exactly. home tour this, uh, I think on Friday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we, we do this all the time because Tops is right. When you see it, it, it just looks so much more different. Uh, I, I take the blame for this one. The, the photos that we have of the shelters just don't do it justice. I think you need to walk in and experience and imagine living there yourself and then compare that to the alternative that a lot of people currently face, which is a tent on a sidewalk or under an overpass. So it is a, it is a dignified and safe step up out of homelessness. And it's that first step towards permanent housing, which as Hafsa and Matt both have said is the ultimate goal. Um, awesome. Well, I think maybe to keep this structured, so just to finish out the site section, so the city owns the land, so is the land then just like understanding the use arrangement? We have this whole Hewlin Campus Collaborative. Um, so we funded CityNet with the operational costs and they literally ramped up so quickly um, in, in weeks and was really 
close with working with Brandon and his team and our general services to make sure where each pallet should be for success. The community engagement piece, when you were picking the site, it sounds like because this site is already kind of near a lot of services that are already being delivered, the, the location of it was, I, I guess, is, was there any like community resistance to it or yeah. were like, did you have to do outreach to neighbors or how did you, how did you finalize yeah. the site process and make sure it's yeah. it was okay? Correct. So since it's not affordable housing, since this is not a permanent supportive housing, it was very quick, right? So when you look at affordable housing, permanent supportive housing, there's all these other pieces with providers, LIHTC and, and all that other stuff. So it wasn't it wasn't that comprehensive. What we did do is when I took it to council uh, and council ratified the different options, it was a public comment period time, you know, so we posted it, we let our constituents know. And we had several different public comments that said, you know, we support this, we support hmm. um, having Having those folks just walk on over a few more steps and actually get housing rather than being on Massachusetts. Um, so that was the community engagement. And I'll also say that Matt and his team did an excellent job sort of having their footprint out in our community saying, hey, look, we already do outreach. So this is something exciting we're going to do. And Brandon and his team did an excellent job when they were actually um, sort of fortifying the little pallet shelters, um, you know, really being, um, you know, I'm folks uh, approach them and really working with the city to say, hey, you know, this is what's being asked. Um, what should we say? So it was just really good camaraderie. And I'm so proud of Brandon and his team and Matt and their team. Uh, Matt, what was the what were the main concerns or questions that were raised or what what was the general theme of those conversations when you were talking to the neighbors or what was the, what were the common mis misperceptions, perhaps, that needed to be explained? Yeah, I mean, I have to say we were we were pleasantly surprised that um, that there was that there was not more resistance. You know, we're used to a lot of uh, communities, you know, across Southern California, a lot of hesitation um, and a lot of uh, just a lot of resistance. It's something that's unknown. Um, but I think in this case, you know, because there was an existing campus of homeless services agencies um, operated by the city and the county in one location, and really um, with this pallet home model, like one of the one of the benefits of it is that it can take um, sort of underutilized pieces of property, which I, I would say this, you know, this this was a parking lot and it's still a parking lot. So essentially what the city did was just took an existing parking lot and just took half of it. So we maintained it as a as a it still functions as a parking lot. Um, it just doesn't have the number of spaces that it had previously, and, so and I would say impact it was nature probably, of the site development yeah, it, was it, a key. It was taking piece. a yeah, it was taking a big a, a big parking lot and making it you know more appropriately sized. If probably a parking lot that was too big, and then I think the other thing is that when you add in um, you know pictures, uh, pictures said you know seven thousand words. So when you add in high quality materials and things that look nice and neat and uh, we we as a team, you know, across the board, um, we were really concerned with aesthetics. Like we wanted it to look nice, not only from a client services standpoint, so that um, the clients would feel dignified and that this was a place that they could focus on their long-term housing and they feel safe. Um, but also because we knew that that would speak to the community and it would speak to fu future projects that the city may want to do in other locations to say, look, here's when we do something, we're going to do it well. Um, we're going to operate it well, it's going to be safe, it's going to be clean, it's going to look nice, it's going to be ideally an improvement on a piece of property that was either underutilized or it's kind of an odds and ends. And lots of communities, cities and counties have these kind of sort of leftover pieces of property. And one of the benefits of the tiny home uh, or pallet shelter model is that it, it gives you, it affords you the opportunity to repurpose some of those um, not only for a homeless, from a homeless services standpoint, but just utilize them from a, from a city services standpoint um, in a way that's relatively low impact on the community. It's not like you're building a big permanent shelter. You know, um, they're, they're modular, they're mobile, they can be taken down. Um, but they look nice. It's an improvement on the existing site. And I think that was important. I would be remiss if I did not mention our planning um, department in this as well. They also were a big part in our in our um, building official. He was a very big part making sure that, you know, all the checklist was, was signed. And I will say Brandon, his and his team, we have not had one report of a pallet falling apart. 
they did an exceptional job. Yes, an exceptional job in making sure all the nuts and the nuts and bolts were in on the on the infrastructure side. And then CityNet did an excellent job with beautifying it by putting welcome home mats and like little inspirational words and you know um, little 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 plants. So it was it was so beautiful for the design setup. So sort of how were those? meetings of like setting up the design, the design and the site plan, uh, how did those, how did that process work? Yeah. So the way that we like to work with cities and the way we worked with Riverside is we're a guest in your city. So we worked with the city of Riverside, their elected leaders, where we were invited to the table table and take a, a more active approach in the planning where we were, where we were invited. Um, in terms of the, the services side that you asked about, we we definitely have connections to services providers across the country, but we knew that Riverside um, already had connections in their own local community. They knew their residents experiencing homelessness far better than we did. So we don't ever choose or advocate or rally for a service provider over another. We leave that up to the local community. Uh, and Riverside chose CityNet, which has been a phenomenal partner. So that's that's why we that's why we defer to the local experts because. We, again, we're guests in your city and we wanna make sure that we're, we're creating the solution that is uh, best suited for the residents that are gonna be living in those shelters. In terms of being low impact, so uh, even if this, so this parking lot, did it have like much of a slope to it or what, what needed to be done? Even yeah, a flat yeah, parking I can, lot, I can, I'm, I'm assuming needs some leveling. Like how does the, how did the foundation layout work? Yeah, I, I can speak let's to start, that. Let's start from the ground um, up and then we can go into yeah, the rest yeah. of the unit. <laughs> The, the beauty of pallet shelters, they were designed to be rapid and scalable. We've got hundreds of thousands of people in America experiencing homelessness. So we've approached this from the point of view that this needs to be a scalable solution. So we've designed these shelters with a uh, structural foundation floor built in. So they can put, they can be put anywhere, almost anywhere that's barely level. We've got them in parking lots. We've got them in baseball fields. We've got a few indoor sites. So they're a very flexible and versatile solution. For this parking lot, it did have a slight slope that we needed to correct for. Uh, the nice thing about our team is that we have a background in construction development. So when we come to the table, we come to the table not only with our modular shelter solution, but we have years of construction development experience. We also have a sister nonprofit uh, that operates services. So we're kind of the, the perfect uh, blend of what's needed for this, this whole project and others. Uh, so we, we worked with the city to identify how to level each site as minimally as possible. The goal here is to keep our cost per bed as low as possible so that we can help as many people as possible. Uh, but yeah, we, we did do a little bit of site leveling for each shelter just to ensure that it's level for the residents that live in them. Um, but yeah, that, that site, it did require minimal, very minimal site prep. Um, and then how customizable is the design? Like how much... Can you customize it or what kind of challenges, uh, and maybe even from, from uh, Hafsa's angle, what design requirements that, that you need or did you need to compromise on in order to have shelter fit the box? One of the biggest challenges we had was how we could basically utilize the bathroom, right? And how that could be the most efficient place possible. Um, we also, from the operator's perspective, and maybe Matt could even speak on this, you know, they know what are the sort of heavy hitter areas when at night, you know, what are some of the concerns for people experiencing homelessness that may have trauma if they want to leave, if they have an anxiety attack. So those are some of the things that CityNet contributed in. Um, in terms of the city's fire marshal, absolutely important that there was access, entry, and exit so that we could comply with all of the rules. In terms of ADA, we were very big about making sure that there was enough room for individuals who have um, specific disabilities. Are all the are all lighting. the units ADA accessible, is there, or is it no, just the, a? We have a designated amount of units that are ADA per uh, proportion that is required through our our planning department and our building official. Yeah, I can speak to. We do have a fire extinguisher in each unit. We also have a smoke detector and a carbon monoxide detector for safety. There's an emergency egress door. So in addition to the main door, if that front door was ever blocked for any reason, there's an emergency exit that the resident can escape safely from. Uh, and because they are, my understanding is in California code, because they are temporary shelters, that fire extinguisher in the unit is sufficient for fire code. Um, the, the city had to pass an ordinance because the units are only 64 square feet, right? Didn't, 
wasn't that a local that was one of those things that got done really fast one of the things that happened in january too is that we passed an emergency ordinance to ensure that we could have um 64 square foot for two individuals this is a separate I think, ordinance i think the city I, yeah i think the code like stipulated 70 square feet is the minimum something like that so they were they were off by a few square feet and the city was very flexible to accommodate the size of the existing pallet units yeah. So if you were, if so, if a city were to declare, a state of emergency, um, they would just include that then as as one of the list of exemptions, like going forward. Or do you have to do two separate actions? I believe you'd have to do two separate actions. Um, we had a item go in December, and we also had an ad item go in January in regards to the mm -hmm. actual building size. Thank you, Matt, for bringing that up. Yeah, the other things that I would say from a like an operator standpoint, when we were in those early days, like, um, and, the, and the city was really, um, you know, they listened and was willing to commit additional funds. Like one was to have the, um, the smoke detectors and the carbon monoxide detectors hardwired as opposed to battery operated. Uh, just as our experience operating shelters was that, um, you know, people would, uh, would uh, if they were battery operated units, people would tamper with them um, so that they could smoke in the units. Um, and smoking is not allowed in, in the inside any of the units. And so um, that was one example we wanted, um, you know, we were, we, were, we were advocating for hardwired um, detectors. And the city um, put in, um, I think they're double paned windows, but I know they're slidable windows up and down, which was an option that not all the pallet shelters had, but the city wanted those um, so that they would, it just creates a, a nicer feel. Um, and then also um, to have each of the units have HVAC. Mm -hmm. So Riverside is really hot in the summer, and this is also in a parking lot. So there's blacktop, which is gonna absorb the heat. And so it's, it's, there are many days of the summer months where it's triple digits. And so to have um, each unit have a, an HVAC unit where they've got air conditioning um, makes a huge difference in terms of comfort and then sort of just overall Sort of peace and quiet within the within the community, just because the the uh, residents are comfortable in their in their units. Um, the other things that that you know, given the sort of the, the slope of the site, um, you know, we had to put the the bathrooms and the ADA units up towards the towards the street. Um, so we worked with the city on lighting, external lighting, um, and also security cameras um, to run you know, power from existing power poles over so that there could be adequate nighttime security lighting. And then also, um, you know, we have a, a pretty a pretty high-end security camera system um, and it requires a lot of cameras just because there's a lot of uh, areas that would otherwise be blind spots. And so um, rather than having security posted to f visually uh, see all the different sort of alleys, um, you know, the city was, was um, was willing to to include in our budget, operating budget a pretty sophisticated camera system, um, which has been very useful. You know, because our again from an operator standpoint, like the two areas that you really have to do well is that, you know, the the shelter, a homeless shelter, whatever it is, in whatever format it is, it has to be safe, it has to feel safe, and it has to be clean, and it has to feel clean. Um, Obviously, from our perspective, the most important thing of a shelter is one is to, to get people into a safe environment so that they're not living unsheltered on the streets. But secondly, to connect them to longer term permanent housing. And um, if people don't feel safe and they don't feel that their immediate needs are taken care of and, and they don't feel, you know, that, that they're in a, in a clean environment, um, they can't focus on those other things. Hmm. So this this model and and even the way the city did i think the other thing i would say that we haven't talked about yet is that the city built a custom deck so um that was pretty remarkable from our perspective to see that happen the, the restrooms and the showers are portable units and even the uh the dining hall is a double wide trailer so we rent these we've rented these units and, and rolled them on the site and then around those units the city built a custom deck and so that's why you can have um for the pallets that are that are sunk down to the level of the deck, and so they're accessible with a wheelchair now. Um, and then you can wheel, and then they built a ramp, and so you, so and those also the reason that those are at the top of the street is because that's where the um, the handicap parking was, and so you can park in theory and 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 ro ro roll over to the uh, to the shelter up the deck into an ADA unit into the double wide for the dining hall into the into the ADA bathrooms and never and all of it be 
level and accessible. Um, and that's only possible, well, I think it's possible in a lot of different ways, but the solution that the city came up with, and I think it worked really well, was to build really what's a custom deck. And it came together really quickly and, and like everything else that the city did, it looks beautiful, um, it functions well, um, and it came together fast. See how, um, why we chose CityNet? <laughs> I mean, both these guys, they know what they're talking about. And you're absolutely right, Matt. You know, um, uh, Charlie, if you want to add this to the website, you can. It's in, in, in a public city council meeting on January 21st. You know, um, our mayor's office did take an amendment to the local building code uh, to um, a shelter crisis and adopt new standards on our municipal code in terms of the of the uh, square foot. So that's uh, designated and written on that. One of the reasons, Charlie, we went with the pallets, too, is because of the, as as Matt Bates said, you know, H, H, H units you know and I, I visit the pallets I you know sometimes I'll go and I'll knock on the doors and say hey how is this project going for you buddy you know I'm talking to the people experiencing homelessness and making sure they're on their path to self-sufficiency and I have not once heard a complaint I go there and I, I and the person answers like it's their home and they're working on their little laptop there's plugins you know uh today I went into one uh because I was giving a tour and it smelled better than my office I mean they had like <laughs> air wick um you know they had something really really pretty um you know people have their family photos they have their blankets um you know and they were just enjoying and and i will tell you riverside does get hot so we've had over 100 degrees nothing's melting on the pallet shelters it's nice and cool inside and then as far as uh resiliency yeah that's a good question uh they are rated for high winds they're rated for uh high snow load i can get you those numbers i don't have them off the top of my head do they meet like permanent code building code in terms of like florida for example would it meet the at least like a prime like your primary residence even though you have to evacuate from the area would it's would that would the shelter still meet code there yeah our our shelters are temporary structures so they're they fall under a different different set of codes and regulations and to be honest the codes and regulations vary even from city to city so that's where from a, a practical standpoint for people that are watching this that are interested in personal shelter or any type of temporary uh, shelter solution, um, it's almost better to handle this on a case by case situation. Hearing what Hafsa and Matt have said around the challenges that their city overcame to install temporary shelter is super helpful, but um, we find just in working with so many different cities and counties that there's a, a code for the state level, there's a code for the city level, and it's it's best if you, out of the gate, get your elected officials involved, get a, a nonprofit service involved in the conversation, get local codes and housing codes involved, and then also your fire marshal is a key person to have at the table. And I, again, it, it really varies. Um, that's where we're able to kind of pollinate these ideas and processes because we work with different cities and counties. Uh, but we do, we don't fall under traditional housing code because we are a smaller structure that is more temporary in nature. Also, yeah, it is softer. Are there operational challenges around congregate shelter? Yeah, have a hybrid in the sense that, um, yes, what well, people are sleeping, um, you know, they have privacy and they have, and they can spend time in their, in their own, you know, individual shelters. Um, but for meals and for case management and for sort of support, uh, supportive services um you know we have a we have like a clubhouse or a, a dining hall um, which is a double wide trailer and it's and it, that it's hooked up to water and power and air conditioning and so it's nice and um and so that's where um you know clients can interact with each other and interact with staff um so in some ways it's it's kind of a hybrid of, of both um it's it's not like bridged housing or of supportive housing where people are in their own apartments and they're totally self-contained um, because the units don't have um, well they're not restrooms and 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 showers but in particular they don't have food and so people at least a couple of times during the day um, are gathered together for food you know covid um, has put a has put a halt on or, or at least slowed down a lot of the supportive services that could take place but there's no reason that you couldn't have you know a full slate of supportive services on site, um, and by that I mean things like you know education and job training and um, and uh, access to public benefits and you know life skills classes and all those kinds of things could be taking place in the um, 
in the, um, well, either indoors or outdoors. So there's an outdoor space, a small outdoor space where people could gather and then indoors in the trailer. We haven't brought those supportive services on site because of COVID and have just relied on the existing campus of services at Hewlin. Um, but there's no reason that those couldn't be. Um, so I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't position it as a challenge. I think it's been, um, it's been a benefit because we've had the, we've had kind of a hybrid of where you've got both, you've got both in one, you've got places where people can be self-contained, but then you've got also opportunities to engage with them, certainly around the meal times and other times, um, you know, in between the meals. What makes City of Riverside very different, what I've noticed, is that we actually have this Office of Homeless Solutions. So a lot of cities will sort of leverage um, positions to respond to homelessness, right? Sometimes they'll be in a small city, your chief of police, or sometimes it'll be, um, you know, your code, or sometimes it'll be um, just, you know, a, a purview within the uh, assistant city manager's office. But we actually have an Office of Homeless Solutions. We actually have staff that are funded to do outreach. And so one of the great things is that we were able to sort of create this liaison relationship in terms of operational um, uh, you know, services. So for example, the city of Riverside's oh, uh, access center uh, provides life skills classes. Um, so we were able to have my project coordinator go over, literally walk over to the pallet and say, hey, this is happening. These are some of the classes, DMD, life skills, uh, conflict mediation, um, you know, trauma and informed care, uh, de-escalation, um, budgeting, things like that. So it was a great community. And one thing that Sedina also did really nice is that they brought these beautiful flower pots. Um, you know, it looks like it came out of home and gardens. It was a uh, tin with all these pretty sort of daisy looking, uh, you know, flowers, so pretty. And then they had an awning to help provide for folks who wanted to take a break and come out. And I think that also speaks to Brandon's um, team and how they were able to sort of space out work with our general services to make sure that there was enough room for people coming in and out. Well, yeah. And, and expanding on that, like if you were to do a phase two expansion of this, like what aspects would you kind of uh, further expand upon or, or emphasize on that? Yeah, on like don't a give me two? ideas, Charlie. Uh, in a perfect world um, right now, uh, we're so lucky that we have the collaborative, the Hewlin campus collaborative of supportive service providers. So we have our kettle, we have our pet kettle already there. So if, you know, CityNet has clients that utilize um, or have pets, which is such a big thing for individuals experiencing homelessness, sometimes these individuals have lost all their family and the only family is their pet. Um, you know, that's, that's their companion. So we have that, but I think in an ideal world, if there was a phase two, we would love to have like a dog run or a grass area, you know, or maybe even um, sort of like an artsy, artsy garden area where, you know, the city net could, could invite uh, folks to do gardening and really, really yeah. show individuals that, you know, on the path of healing, they can explore hobbies that will help them uh, gain the skills to thrive. Uh you know, Southern California has such a great climate, um, but part of the site, you know, it was a former parking lot and it's surrounded on, on two sides by industrial properties and on one side by a street, on the other side by existing, you know, um, county buildings. And so there's just not a lot of greenery or sort of outdoor space. Well, and there's no, there's no reason that, you know, at a different site that you couldn't have more, you couldn't, the, the residents couldn't enjoy more indoor outdoor space. Um, and then I think the other thing is like, is just, you know, and this is really, I, I put this at the doorstep of COVID is really, if they're going to be a phase two, you know, the, the possibility is really to surround, to create more of a multi-surface and center environment where you're surrounding the residents with, with a robust um, sort of a supplement of supportive services. And so, you know, Hofstra had mentioned that she's run shelters in, in Santa Ana and that shelter, you know, operates on that model. City Nets run other shelters where, um, and we do run other shelters now where we, we can, um, you know, in non COVID times, you can, you can provide like a robust uh, array of supportive services. And I think that's um, again, something that, that would work, work really well with this population because they've, they've transitioned um, and they feel so comfortable um, and they feel they're not they're, they're the, the, the no, a lot of the normal stresses related to homelessness have, have subsided. I mean, we're really talking about the housing first model, right? You put people in shelter housing first, and then you can address all of their issues that are keeping them from long-term um, housing um, in, in, a, in, in a series. Housing comes first, and then from that platform, 
you can connect them to the care that they need. Everything from, you know, mental health services to uh, behavioral health services to um, a, a physical health. So we have mobile medical units and other places that will come in and do everything from vision and dental and uh, primary care um, to, you know, job training and skills development and life skills and education and support groups and just on and on and on. Um, one to make, you know, life at the uh, shelter more comfortable and more enjoyable, uh, but two, to prepare people and connect them to longer term forms of housing. You look at the size of the problem and there's, you know, for example, in LA County, 60,000 uh, uh, people that are unsheltered and you need to, sh you need to scale the pallet shelter village model 10x. What would you do in order to like, I guess, um, manage it in a much more streamlined fashion even like are there what's where's the where's there room for improvement where you can you can offer more services still a cost-effective way in terms of future recommendations a site is very important ideally it would be great if our site didn't have a little bit of slope um, so you want to sort of have you know an area that has a vast amount of um, space um, you know, it's really uh, one of the things City Next staff came up with a, with the a name village because it, it feels like a village, you know, so you want to be able to, uh, in, in, in a way, it worked out really well, but it is a parking lot. I would love to see in an ideal world, you know, if I got the sprinkles and the unicorns and all of that and the rainbows, I would love to have, you know, a big field of some sort, right? And so, you know, you could have another area where people go maybe for, um, you know, uh, more additional classes or um, more bathrooms or, um, you know, more services. Maybe you could have, um, you know, a, a building where you had DMD come or you had the mental health providers kind of set up as stations on the daily. So, um, you know, it works. Um, this is one of, to Brandon's point, this is a model that could work isolated just by itself in one little area, or it's a model that could become a village. From Matt's perspective, is there like a sweet spot of like where this type of typology hits like a operational efficiency. You know, if you had to do, let's say 500 beds in a community, the, the question is, do you do one village of 500 or do you do, you know, 10 villages of 50? And I think it's somewhere between 35 to 50 is kind of the right, uh, the right size. I think that's probably where the sweet spot is, at least just from an operational standpoint in terms of achieving outcomes for um, the residents that are positive outcomes, recognizing that that's not always possible. That so that at some in some communities, you know, if you're going to get fought over every every you know square inch, you know, it might be easier to to decide a bigger project in one location. But I think from a operating standpoint, we really do see that a smaller, you know, and by small, I'm saying you know, 35 to 75 beds somewhere in there um, is a good amount. The larger you get. I think you lose some of the sense of, uh, you lose some of the sense of community. Um, that's part of it. Uh, and, and I think the other part of it is that um, the, it just becomes, it becomes more difficult to manage from a security standpoint and to keep everybody straight. And then also just, you know, and this is one of the issues that we face. I know that on the list of questions that I see here, you know, what are some of the bigger challenges that we face? So one of the, one of the challenges that we faced there in the early days, it's not there now, uh, but in the early days of this project was that you know, there was an encampment right outside on the other side of the gate. And so people form relationships. And so if there are people that are interested in, let's say, legal behaviors, they don't want to comply with the rules of the of the community, you know, shelter. Um, but they can camp right outside the gate. They can still have access to the people and they can pass information or materials back and forth. And so it creates an environment where uh, the, the, those that are in the in the um, the community aren't focused on their long term success necessarily. So I think um, you know we've seen in big shelters the bigger that you get, um, the harder it is to manage those kinds of things. And you need more security. You need more. Um, you just need more attention. If it's too small, um, then you can't really bring the case management and the supportive services around. So I think that that if you know. This model, the promise of it to me, again, as an operator and as one who doesn't have to always fight those, um, those community battles to get these things cited is that a city or a municipality can look at these kind of odds and ends pieces of land that, that, that are under, underutilized and difficult to repurpose for some other purpose. And, and you could put 
you know, 25, 30, 50 of these units uh, pretty easily, connect them, bring in supportive services and a smaller shelter like this, um, you know, it's easier to achieve positive outcomes for the residents of the shelter. Um, Cause you can, and you can create a, um, you can create an overall, um, you know, sort of community presence and identity um, with a group of that size and and a focus, I think, which is really important for shelters. What are what are the uh, uh, red, what are the res, what are the residents saying um, about living there? Yeah, so very very positive feedback. I mean, initially, um, you know, it's just such a relief to be off the streets and in a in a shelter. Um, but then when they realize that the food is good and that they're treated with respect and dignity, um, that the accommodations are comfortable. Um, you know, that, that, that issues that come up, you know, like if let's say the water's not hot in the showers or, you know, in, in, invariably you're gonna have issues, but it's how you deal with them. And as issues that come up, they're, they're dealt with and they're resolved, um, that, that people are connected to case management. I think it's, it's been overwhelmingly positive. Um, we've had some, like in any shelter that have opted out and, and that have said like, have decided after a few days, this is not for me or, or I'd, I'm not ready, or I'd rather be out on the streets. But we keep the door open, um, and we tr and we never give up, obviously. Um, and so we've had a number of those people even return because they recognize that it's a safe place, and it's a it's a place where they are treated with dignity and respect, that their needs are cared for, um, and that there's a possibility they see the outflow too. We've had enough success stories of people being connected to permanent housing that they can see that as a possibility for themselves too. And it kind of engenders hope and trust in the process. And again, we're working with people that, um, in many cases, have felt left down by this left left. They felt let down by the system or left out by the system. And so we're having to rebuild trust. They've heard before that somebody you know is for them and wants to connect them to resources, and it hasn't worked out. And so um, so we're trying to build trust or rebuild trust. Um, and I think the first step of that is to create a comfortable you know, comfortable environment. So I think it's been overwhelmingly positive. And, and when there have been complaints or issues, you know, we work quickly with the city to address them and everybody's on the same team and that same sort of team spirit and positive attitude that served, you know, the entire project well to get it off the ground um, serves us well in that um, there's good lines of communication. And so if something comes up, we deal with it right away and we resolve it. And, um, and people see that working and they, that it's worked that the system is now working on their behalf and i think that makes a big difference it's it's incredibly powerful to me to see that individuals experiencing homelessness they too want to be protected and protect others and so we were able to have that um you know access of resources and i'll do my moderate monitoring <clears throat> i'll go out and like i said earlier you know people have said this is such a great <laughs> they have said, this is such a great experience. I feel safe. I have my own space. I don't have to feel like I'm next to each other, or someone bumping into each other. You know, I feel like I have self autonomy. And I think to this day, we started in March, I think there's been 26 individuals that have been connected to permanent housing, which is great. Oh, wow, that's great. Because you have to get folks documented, you have to get their ID, you have to get their social security and whatnot, you have to, you know, work through their different medical bills, and etc. So um, we've had quite the success rate. And we'll be putting everything on our data dashboard. And if you actually go on our office of um, Homeless Solutions website, you'll see beautiful narratives of individuals holding their keys, going into their doors. And these, you know, pictures are a thousand words. And so CityNet is doing a great job providing those um, precious moments. And you actually have narratives of people see doing that. Uh, we post it on social media, we have Facebook, Twitter, and you'll see the responses and constituents and businesses and stakeholders, uh, you know, they say, wow, you know, you're really making a difference. If you were to build a, a, a new community village uh, twice the size or at the next iteration, what would you do or what would be included on your wish list? I, I guess first I'd reiterate that working with the Riverside and City Net team the first time was a dream, um, so I would repeat all of that. But in terms of scaling and as you grow, um, you know, as you were talking with Matt about when you get into shelter communities that are in the hundreds of shelters in size, it does help to choose multiple sites. 
and maybe have a common area where services are located. I would defer to Matt and his team on the best way to manage because they're the experts in services. But we know from experience in our some of our larger community sizes that when they are all on the same lot, it's helpful to create miniature pods in that 30 to 50 shelter sweet spot that Matt mentioned. So let's say you've got a shelter community of 120, you do four at 30 each potentially so that that community forms naturally. Community is something we've all talked about a lot on this call so far. And community, it, it's sometimes an overused word, but it truly is key to this model that the shelter is important and the services are important and the site's important, but really we're of the opinion that the magic happens because of the residents that live there. We designed this model and we designed these shelters with people who have lived experience in homelessness. So it wasn't me, it wasn't our founder that decided this, it was to actually have lived in homelessness and have pulled themselves out of it. And we said to them, what do you need? What did you need and what helped you succeed? And how can we share that with others that are in that place today? And that's how we, we arrived at this model. And they said over and over again, the community is key. Uh, just like you and I, we talk to our neighbors when we have a hard time. If, if, you, if you were to, you know, God forbid, miss your, um, miss your mortgage payment or your rent payment and you need help, who do you talk to? You talk to your family or your friends. And when you're someone on the street living in homelessness, you don't have anybody to go to, you're just in a hard spot and you need that safety net, whatever that safety net looks like. And I think that's why you see a lot of people who are experiencing homelessness gathering in, in areas where you have tents and encampments because they, they crave that security like we all do. So the community, again, although it is sometimes an overused word, it, it truly is key to the model because you need to provide services and that's where people like uh, Matt and his team come in. That's absolutely critical. But at the end of the day, um, if somebody wants to change, that change is going to come from within and it's going to come from their, their network of peers. Well said. We have really good city leadership. Um, our city manager uh, is a planner and understands the nuances of of what it takes to build something out. Um, our mayor has been such a proponent and, you know, camped out there. And he says, these are my homeless neighbors. And, you know, he's going to actually end up being one of the executive directors of the, of the nonprofits next door of Path of Life. So we have invested people. Um, and when I say invested people, meaning the people who have passion to see a community get better. And I think from our directors too, from our building official to our general services, when you take and embark on a project like this, it's so philanthropic. And then they go out there, they put that extra touch. I see my colleagues going above and beyond because you know it's for a good cause. Um, so I just really wanna say what makes it unique for me for the city of Riverside is that, you know, the inspiration's there, the leadership is there, and we all work collectively together um, through excellent communication. Well, also, that's a great, yeah, that's a great key takeaway. I think what Hafsa said is a great way to end it. And I, I echo that. I've said that a few times on this call and it's worth repeating. The city of Riverside worked fast. They treated this like the emergency that it is. And that's why this is such a success story for the people that have moved on to permanent housing because there are people in leadership that care for their residents and that were willing to move fast to get things done. So uh, yeah, I, another kudos to Hafsa and the entire team at the city of Riverside and also CityNet who continues to after the project is up. <laughs> That's where the work happens long-term is, is working with residents. We can't, I give can't kudos, Brandon, to your team and CityNet. And we just all really support each other and work together well. There's a real power in positive, you know, attitudes. Um, this is kind of a project where there's a million points along the way people could have looked at it and said, well, this, there's, this isn't going to work or it's too expensive or, you know, or, you know, it's not going to happen or it's not going to happen now. Um, and we've, I think we've all probably worked with people in our careers like that, that, that they just, they just, you know, they see the reasons that things can't work. And this was a situation where everybody was on the same page and, and, and there were, there were challenges and there were obstacles, but we were all determined that we were going to overcome them and we were going to do it in a positive fashion. And there's real power in that. So, and, and I, I think that does really go back to leadership. So kudos to the city, um, you know, not only the elected officials, but the, the city staff that, that served them um, because 
you know, they, they think that projects like this don't just happen. People make them happen and they make them happen when they're willing to work, work together and, and in a positive way to overcome any barriers that present themselves. So it's just really fun to be a part of. All right. Perfect. Well, uh, Hafsa, Matt, Brandon, thank you so much for all of your time this evening and, uh, you know, really talking about the nuts and bolts of how this project came together and getting kind of a honest uh, behind the scenes look at this really innovative shelter community. So thank you so much uh, for your time and uh, keep up the great work out there. Thank you. Thank you, guys.